Welcome to Ingest, the podcast series designed for primary care and brought to you by the Primary Care Society for Gastroenterology. My name's Charlie Andrews. I'm a GP with an extended role in gastroenterology based near Bath. Ingest is an educational podcast series bringing you up-to-date, reliable advice from experts in the field of gastroenterology. It is not designed to replace your clinical judgment or guidelines, but is purely for educational purposes. In this episode, I'm going to be speaking to Dr. Andrew Moore about Barrett's esophagus. Andrew is a consultant gastroenterologist based in Liverpool. He has an interest in and has undertaken research in the area of upper gastrointestinal malignancy and precancerous lesions. So without further ado, on to the episode. Thank you so much, Andrew, for joining me today. It's great to have you on the podcast. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the advice. We're going to be talking about Barrett's esophagus. So why don't we kick that off by, by asking the question, what is Barrett's esophagus? So Barrett's esophagus is the name given to the condition in which a portion of the uh, normal squamous epithelial lining of the esophagus is replaced by columnar epithelium. So that's that's seen at endoscopy with it by a change in, in colour of the of a portion, usually of the distal esophagus, uh, from the nice pale pink squamous lining that you'll see, like skin on the inside of your mouth, uh, a change into the dark colour that you would see in the stomach or the intestine. And what's the relevance of that? You can't talk about Barrett's esophagus without talking about esophageal adenocarcinoma, because that's the ultimate conclusion of that disease process. So adenocarcinoma is the commonest type of, of esophageal cancer that affects uh, Caucasian populations. So in the UK, we, we see about nine and a half, ten thousand cases of esophageal cancer uh, every year. And around about 60, 60 to 70 percent of those will be adenocarcinoma. And of course, the majority of those cases of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus present with no prior history of Barrett's. Um, so the, the theory is if you can find the precursor lesion, which is Barrett's esophagus, you, it gives you an opportunity to identify the precursor changes of cancer. So is Barrett's therefore a precancerous condition that is important to pick up on? Exactly. So that's that. Well, that, that's the theory, and certainly that's borne out in our clinical practice. Although there are some controversies in that regard. Even in people with Barrett's esophagus, cancer is relatively uncommon. So a, around about a half a percent of people with Barrett's esophagus will go on to develop either high-grade dysplasia or cancer per year. Um, and the estimate roughly is that about sort of 10% of people with Barrett's will develop cancer in their lifetime. So that, so Barrett's is the precursor lesion for granulocarcinoma. And what's the prevalence of Barrett's esophagus? It, that's difficult to estimate, really. It, there have been a few studies in Western populations. It's probably in the region of, a, of what, about 1.5%. Uh, of an unselected population but it is of course much more prevalent as you'd expect in people with reflux so about 14 or 15 percent of patients with established reflux symptoms will 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 have Barrett's esophagus. Mm. We're going to talk a bit about sort of when we should suspect uh, Barrett's esophagus but just sticking to the prevalence side of things are we seeing the prevalence increase one and a half percent seems quite a lot but are we seeing the prevalence increase uh, over years in this country? We have, yeah. I think um, that along with all of the conditions we diagnose down in endoscope, we're seeing the prevalence increase. And it's hard to tease out whether or not that's really because there are increasing numbers of patients with the condition or because we're seeing more, because we do more, we do a lot of endoscopy and more and more every year. But the, the incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma has risen. Uh, and it, it, I think in a, a fairly recent American study, it had risen fourfold over the preceding decade. So that certainly is climbing. And so you can infer from that that the, the prevalence of the precursor lesion is increasing as well. So we, we, we think it's on the rise and we certainly find more and more of it. Hmm. So this is, this is a really important thing for us to be picking up and thinking about. Um, could you give us a bit of pointers about when, when we as GPs or primary care clinicians should be thinking about or suspecting Barrett's esophagus? Are there some risk factors? Is there a typical patient that we could think about here? There are, I mean, there are some very well well described and uh, and demonstrated risk factors for Barrett's. We know, of course, that the the, the uh, risk of developing Barrett's increases with age, and that reflects the fact that reflux disease is common. 
and uh, the longer you expose, the longer your distal esophagus is expo exposed to reflux, the greater the chance of developing Barrett's. So it, as age increases, so does the risk of Barrett's. Abdominal obesity is also a risk factor presumably because that abdominal obesity increases the pressure on the stomach and increases the chance of having reflux. Um, it, it's common in Caucasians than in other in, in other subtypes, and the, the there is a family a family. Uh, clustering in in a proportion of patients, so around about seven percent of patients will will have a family history of Barrett's or cancer. And if you take somebody with established Barrett's or established um, esophageal adenocarcinoma, you can usually find a well, you can find a first degree relative with Barrett's in, a, in just about a third of patients. Mm. So th this is covered in both the American and the British guidelines, both of which are relatively elderly now. We recommend that you can screen for patients. Uh, screen for Barrett's esophagus in patients with a history of chronic reflux and or three or more of the risk factors. So white race over the age of 50, abdominal obesity or a family history. And it's fairly common practice to offer a one-off screening endoscopy to people who've got a history of reflux for more than about 10 years. Um, although that's not a sort of widespread, as you know, not, not, a, not a population based screening program as such. And where do lifestyle factors come into it? So thinking about alcohol and smoking, are they risk factors for Barrett's? Uh, alcohol it is a, a weak risk factor for Barrett's and esophageal adenocarcinoma, but much more so for, for the other type, the other main type of esophageal cancer, which is, of course, squamous cell carcinoma. Similarly for, for smoking, but smoking, it, it gives a bit of a mixed story in the, in, the, in the studies that have looked at that as a risk factor for Barrett's. But, but both probably play a role. Of course, it's difficult to tease out lifestyle factors in those epidemiological studies because those lifestyle factors tend to be prevalent in patients from more deprived backgrounds. And we know for sure that the incidence of Barrett's and cancer is greater in those populations. And the, the, and the survival for, for, for esophageal cancer is, is much lower in those socially deprived populations. So it's a, it's a, that's a, a, a less clear picture, uh, but, but probably still play a role. And in primary care, we see huge numbers of patients with reflux, with dyspepsia. I think it's one of the, you know, one of the commonest presentations that we really get. Um, and so we want to make sure we're not missing these patients with Barrett's because we just talked about how important it is to pick them up to prevent any progression. You know, when we are presented with, you know, huge numbers of patients with dyspepsia, with, with reflux, which ones should we be thinking about Barrett's in? Uh, which ones should we be sending forwards for? As you mentioned, there's sort of a screening endoscopy. Um, mm. Could you give us a bit of your insights around that? Well, that, that is, it's, a it's, it's a difficult subject because I think if you looked at your, your total practice population, and again, it depends what area of the country you live in and what your, your practice population looks like. But if you, re if you really dug into it and pulled out everybody with a 10-year history of reflux, then you could quickly overwhelm your local endoscopy department with one-off screening endoscopies. But I think those the, the guideline, the British guideline is fairly pragmatic, although as I say, it's it's quite it's it's a few years old now. And I would say that you can I, I wouldn't go out uh, offering it routinely to, uh, to to your entire practice population. But in those patients with long-standing troublesome reflux, especially those who are poorly controlled on usual medical um, measures, so perhaps a history of more than 10 years of poorly controlled reflux. And those with those additional risk factors, so so the, the men, the over fifties, and the the abdominally obese for sure, those, those are the ones. And a spe and and a, and also I'd say those with a strong family history, so one or more first degree relatives with with a Barrett's cancer, I would and a long history of reflux, I would offer a one off screening endoscopy too. But it's not it it hasn't been validated for sort of population wide screening, so it's not the sort of thing you need to go and ask your practice data managers and dig into the numbers and start looking for work if you know what I mean. On the screening side of things I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here but I'm interested um, do you think there's going to be a role for things like cytosponge to help pick up these patients? Well that, that, that's the big question and cytosponge I mean, that's a that's a, a bit of a success story in development uh, that was a technology developed by um, a gastroenterologist uh, scientist called Rebecca Fitzgerald in Cambridge and her group and that's been well validated for screening for uh, Barrett's esophagus in selected populations or at-risk populations already. 
there are sort of two questions in that. The first is how effective would cytosponge be at picking up Barrett's? And the answer is very effective. It's it's very sensitive for the detection of Barrett's and for dysplasia and for esophageal cancer as it happens. Um, and the other question is, should we do it? Because we, we, we would find lots and lots of Barrett's esophagus and then spend a, a huge amount of money and resource and time on, on monitoring them, keeping them under surveillance over the years. And I, d I don't think the data would really support that as being a a, 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 a useful screening uh, exercise. But that, of course, is always a contentious and difficult uh, subject to discuss. So cytosponge is definitely has a role to play, but it, but quite what that role is yet is yet to be seen. COVID brought cytosponge into sharp focus for lots of lots of us. It, it, because endoscopy being an aerosol generating procedure is one of the first things I'm sure you remember to be shut down during COVID. And so lots of trusts supported by an NHS England initiative used cytosponge as a sort of one-off uh, uh, surveillance technique to defer the uh, surveillance procedure for lots of their patients. And I think in time we'll see that validated as a, as a surveillance replacement technique, but that, you know, that time will tell that has to be studied. Mm. Just for those who don't know what cytosponge is, can you give a one liner on what that is? Just just it, to let everyone yeah, know, I know we just went we just went off on it because I, I of course sorry. I'm really it, I mean, yeah. it, it looks like a medieval torture device, but it's it, it's a it's a much better tolerated alternative to endoscopy. It's essentially a a a, a polyethylene or plastic, you know, sort of plastic. Um, looks like a sponge, a black sponge, folded up inside a dissolvable capsule on a string. So you swallow the capsule, it dissolves in the stomach, and then you pull the string and out comes a sponge and brushes a, a, a wide area of epithelial cells as it comes. The sponge then gets sent off, the cells get harvested and they're analysed uh, in a special laboratory and, and you get an answer of whether, you know, whether you've got uh, certain biomarkers for Barrett's esophagus. Great. We'll have to watch this space with that, I think, won't we? So let's let's come back to now and think about how we make the diagnosis. So once we've referred someone on to secondary care, how is the diagnosis of, uh, of Barrett's esophagus made? So ne nearly always made, incidentally, patients referred either because of reflux symptoms, not, not commonly with, with the indications we discussed as a dedicated screening referral, usually just reflux which is difficult to treat or other, other dyspeptic symptoms and it it's a set it's essentially fairly easy to diagnose it it, re, it relies on the endoscopist being able to identify and record the position of specific landmarks in the in the upper gi tract so the first of those is the junction between the stomach and the esophagus the gastroesophageal junction and the uk guidelines keep it simple the way we measure that in the uk is we look at the top of the stomach folds and where the where the where you see the ends of the folds of the stomach, that's the GOJ. Other there are there are some arguments that you should look for subtle mucosal uh, factors, but we just stick to the basics: the top of the gastric folds and the GOJ. And if you've got more than a centimeter of columnar, that darker pink epithelium above the the folds, then you've got Barrett's esophagus, and that's confirmed by a biopsy. And it's it's clear that now that transnasal endoscopy, which is being rolled out around the country uses as much smaller caliber endoscope and much tinier forceps is still a, a good way of identifying and diagnosing Barrett's with, with confirmatory histology. Okay, so this is diagnosed at endoscopy, often because a patient's been referred in for troublesome reflux symptoms, and then the endoscopist has to be able to identify these changes and take the biopsies that are required. Is that is that right? That's it. So the, the, uh, all, all endoscopists will be trained how, how to identify and record those landmarks. And there's a, there's a, there's a special uh, classification called the Prague criteria we use to record the position of the various landmarks. And so we can, we can compare from one endoscopy examination to another. And just with that, with the Prague, again, maybe going off on a little bit of a tangent, but, um, you know, if we get clinic letters from, from the hospital and it's saying Barrett's esophagus Prague for three what, yeah. what does this mean to us as gps so the, so that it's a, it's a it's a really simple measurement encoded to confuse everybody uh, so the, the two the two letters you'll see usually will be the c and the m and that just stands for circumferential and maximum length 
So if you see it, if you see Prague C C two M four, it means that there are that there are two centimeters worth of um, Barrett's epithelium covering the entire epithelium, and an additional two centimeters, so a total of four centimeters of perhaps tongues of, of Barrett's. Um, you may also see TIM or tops of islands of mucosa. So sometimes you'll see a contiguous segment of Barrett's esophagus and then a centimetre or so above a couple of dots of culminant met metaplasia, and that's sometimes recorded as TIM, tops of the islands. But it's more sensible to include those into the into the normal thing. So it's a bit of a code, but it lets it lets one endoscopist know what it looked like the preceding time. And especially when we when we go on to deliver endoscopic therapy, it's important to be able to measure the differences from one examination to the next. So in primary care, we shouldn't be overly worried about those numbers, but they're there hopefully now. Our listeners will know what they mean, which is great. That's right. Um, and uh, it, 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 on that note, if you have a lot of Barrett's, does that put you at mm. much higher risk than if you've only got a very small amount? I'm assuming it would. Yep. It does, yeah. It probably does increase the risk of, of progression through dysplasia into cancer. That's one of the relevances of the length of segment. It probably reflects a severity of reflux disease as well. And we think that there are a number of reasons for us to suspect that severe very ongoing exposure to gastric refluxate is, is, is a driver for development of dysplasia and cancer in the esophagus. There is also this small or this subset of patients who develop cancer in very short, extra short segments of Barrett's esophagus. They're the group of patients that keep me awake at night. They're the ones who don't, who sometimes don't get offered surveillance. And so it doesn't help you to pick out the length of their Barrett's because they probably belong to a different uh, sort of disease biology. You've talked several times about surveillance, so I'm going to ask you a bit about that as we move on to kind of how do we manage Barrett's esophagus. So, what is this survey? What is the surveillance for Barrett's esophagus? What um, obviously we're trying to make sure that they're not progressing towards adenocarcinoma. Is that correct? So, surveillance in Barrett's is, uh, is 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 done endoscopically. The surveillance interval depends on a couple of factors, partly related to the length of Barrett's and partly related to the histological subtype. And that's covered in the British Society of Gastroenterology guidelines as well. And they're, they're available to download and have a, have a scan through for any of your listeners who might be interested. They're, they're quite good, easy to read, and there's a nice executive summary in, in, contained with them as well. Once we've sort of risk stratified our patients, we've confirmed the diagnosis and risk stratified them, they're given a sort of surveillance interval. And this is all sort of, as you might imagine, locally arranged so each trust has a different approach to the way they arrange their surveillance in our trust anyone who's found to have barrett's any mention of the prague criteria on an industry report puts them in a database and our specialist specialist nurses will will interview them once at the time of diagnosis explain to them their risk stratification and, and what the next steps are and then each time they come they'll have an a, a normal gastroscopy a quick look around the stomach and duodenum before a careful examination of the esophagus and recording of the landmarks we've talked about, as well as a protocol, uh, a set of biopsies we call the Seattle protocol, which is a which are quadrantic biopsies taken every two centimeters through the segment. So we'll typically say you biopsy at 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock every two centimeters throughout the Barrett segment. And and that's that's the standard of, of surveillance. Um, I mean it's not perfect. Far from it. You know, we know that the proportion of people will develop uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma between inter uh, surveillance intervals. And what sort of treatments would a patient with Barrett's be given? Almost all of, our, of your patients with Barrett's esophagus will be treated for their reflux disease. And of course, you'll be the mainstay of that these days is PPIs, remains PPIs. And, and PPIs probably, or, or they do reduce the risk of you progressing through the disease stages with Barrett's esophagus. Um, so there's a there's a study uh, performed and um, published a, a couple of years ago now called the Aspect Trial, which looked at both uh, PPIs and aspirin, um, and showed a, a modest but significant benefit uh, for both of those drugs, PPIs in particular, but a combination of the two uh, were, were better than either alone. So for for nearly everybody, PPIs with, with the target of controlling the patient's symptoms would be the mainstay of treatment. I don't think people are widely recommending the routine use of aspirin just based on the outcome of the aspect trial at this stage. Uh, it's it's being studied further. There's a question of, of whether or not your patients on with Barrett should be give, routinely given high-dose PPI. 
And I think, we, you know, I recommend that your patients are treated with the lowest dose required to control their symptoms. But if they have a failure, everybody should have high dose PPI indefinitely unless they've got mm. side effects or intolerability or, or, um, or other contraindications. And what sort of lifestyle advice do you tend to give in clinic to your patients with Barrett's? I, this, exactly the same lifestyle advice I give to people who've got troubles from reflux disease, which is the usual dietary advice, avoid triggers, lose weight, especially for those middle-aged Caucasian blokes who've got a bit of abdominal obesity. And for the patients who've got troublesome symptoms, those usual lifestyle measures, sometimes things like propping the head of the bed up, et cetera. But the, the, the risk factors for um, Barrett's are exactly the same as those for troublesome reflux. So I give them the lifestyle advice you'd be familiar with for your patients with reflux disease. So we want to try and get that reflux disease under control. That's sort of the whole aim. And it's very much the same for Barrett's as, as for reflux, just standard reflux. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. In terms of sort of the endoscopic treatment, if there are worrying areas seen, are you able to give us a quick overview of, of kind of what our patients might be offered if something is changing, if there are concerning features there? The, the reason Barrett's is such a good, or so, is said to be such a good target for surveillance is because there's a clear pathway from non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus through to the cancer. And that's through low-grade dysplasia, then high-grade dysplasia. So there's a clear pathway. And we, we think that if you've got high-grade dysplasia, you've got roughly a 10% chance of developing esophageal adenocarcinoma every year. Low-grade dysplasia is a bit trickier. The rate of progression from low-grade dysplasia to high-grade or cancer is very variable. And that's mostly because it's difficult to distinguish between low-grade dysplasia and inflammation under the microscope. That's acknowledged in both the American and the British guidelines. So in a nutshell, what we say to people is, if they have a visible abnormality on a surveillance examination for Barrett's, then that should be re-examined in a specialist center. We recommend it's biopsy, target biopsy, along with the usual Seattle protocol biopsies, and, and then examined again in a specialist center, especially if there's dysplasia incorporating the biopsies. As a, as a rule, any any nodule or focal abnormality in Barrett's really ought to be resected because it's a marker of, of more advanced disease. Most of our patients who those referred for treatment for dysplastic Barrett's uh, just just reported to have their usual Barrett segment. It's it's uncommon for people to report a focal abnormality, and the findings of dysplasia are usually made just on the biopsies, the Seattle Protocol biopsies. So for those with low-grade dysplasia, what we ask is that they have a, another examination after a period of high-dose acid suppression. So we say the British guidelines say six months. High-dose PPI, so that's twice a day, for example, 30 milligrams of lansoprazole or 40 bimeprazole, twice a day for six months, and a repeat examination with protocol biopsies. And if you've got persistent low-grade dysplasia, we know that the chance of you just having inflammation as a background has now been diminished, and we take that more seriously. For patients with high-grade dysplasia, we, we take that seriously straight away, and they're discussed through the, the local uh, upper GI uh, cancer MDT. Um, and in the absence of, of other worrying findings, they get referred for, for endoscopic treatment at that point. And endoscopic treatment is, is I, 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 I describe it to my patients as combined endoscopic treatment. I can send everybody for, for the combination of two techniques. The first would be an endoscopic resection, so uh, nibbling or cutting away the abnormal areas of, of tissue in the Barrett's segment, usually done by what we call piecemeal resection. So the commonest technique these days is to use a little cap attached to the end of the endoscope with some elastic bands on the outside. And we suck the abnormal area up, deploy the elastic band to pull that up into a polyp, and then we snip that off with an electrical diathermy snare. Um, and, we, and we do that. We, we do that when there's a focal abnormality and we sometimes see those in people that have been referred with high grade dysplasia, even if they haven't had that report at their local site, but less commonly with low grade. Once we've done that, or if they don't have a focal abnormality to resect, then we ablate the rest of the Barrett's esophagus. And the commonest technique to do that these days is RFA, radiofrequency ablation. And that uses a variety of catheters that we can either clip onto the end of the endoscope or pass down the instrument channel of the endoscope or even pass down on a, on a big balloon for larger segments of Barrett's. And that's pressed up against the Barrett's mucosa and delivers a really nicely controlled dose of microwave energy, thermal energy, 
uh, which then just just burns the very superficial layer of mucosa, the sort of top half a millimeter or millimeter of mucosa. And that's been shown to be very effective at, at, at obliterating dysplastic disease and, and in lots of patients, their, their Barrett's esophagus altogether. A really nice overview of how to manage Barrett's. I, I, I'm amazed that you managed to do it in that period of time. You did amazingly there. So thank, <laughs> thanks very much. I, I, um, I, I, I've spent, I spent a long time summarizing it to patients in clinics, so I'm, <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> it's really helpful for us in primary care because understanding, you know, the, the, the basics of Barrett's, but also understanding some of the more um, advanced mm -hmm. techniques that are going to be used on, on, on a handful of our patients is really important so that we can understand and get a feel for, for what, is, what is actually happening. And when we see clinic letters, we understand things better. So thanks a lot. I thought that was a really helpful uh, overview. We're coming to the end now, and this is your opportunity to kind of give any uh, final key points, you know, take home messages for our audience. So do you have anything, any sort of key take home points you'd like to share before we finish today? Well, I, I mean, I think I would say um, be, uh, reflux disease is extremely common and, uh, and only a tiny minority of your patients with reflux will ever develop bar either Barrett's or, of course, esophageal adenocarcinoma. But be, be uh, mindful of those who are at risk. So a history of chronic reflux and other risk factors, for example, age over 50, abdominal obesity, male gender, they're the people to think about a one-off screening examination for Barrett's esophagus. The, the, the other big story really related to Barrett's, but not directly about Barrett's, is, is the diagnosis of adenocarcinoma, because the majority of our patients present with late disease, and we, that's why we see a 10-year survival of less than 15% for esophageal adenocarcinoma. So it's about uh, being mindful of those early symptoms of adenocarcinoma, and even educating our patients, especially those from more deprived social backgrounds, about the signs of the early signs of esophageal cancer, so that they can be promptly investigated and, and hopefully treated successfully. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Andrew, for joining me today. A brilliant um, overview of Barrett. So, so thank you. My pleasure, Charlie. Thanks for having me. And thank you, the listener, for joining us today. I hope that you found this episode useful and interesting. It's quite a common condition. 1.5% of the population seem to have Barrett's esophagus. So it's important that we're aware of when we should be suspecting it and have an understanding of what happens once they've been diagnosed with the condition. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about a variety of topics in gastroenterology that are relevant to primary care, uh, Ingest is available on Spotify and iTunes, and it's also available on the Primary Care Society for Gastroenterology website. We have episodes stretching back over the last 18 months and uh, lots and lots of different topics and learning that you can get your teeth into there. If you'd like to provide any feedback, we're always very keen to hear from you. So any thoughts about new episodes or any queries or questions about the episode that you've listened to, we're really happy to, to hear from you. Finally, if you've enjoyed this, please do share with your colleagues. It's great for us all to improve our knowledge of gastroenterology so that we can provide the best possible care for our patients with these conditions. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>